We don't have big corporate backers. In fact, we have small backers like yourself. To keep this activist news show going, visit patreon.com slash act out to become a donor. This week on Act Out, oh Canada. Justin Trudeau may seem an easy on the eyes, Prince Charming type, but he is in fact this week's recipient of the Low Life Scum Award. And here are six reasons why. Next up, Canadian climate system scientist Paul Beckwith joins us to talk about climate change and the real tough solutions far beyond recycling and biking to work. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield and this is your Tipping Point. Oh, Canada. And oh, Justin Trudeau, because not a day goes by without someone from the U.S. praising the Prime Minister. His traditional good looks, his support for refugees, his firm handshake when he encountered Donald Trump. Or hey, did we mention that he's good looking? And yes, I know, it is so tempting to think that the body double for Prince Eric and the Little Mermaid is just the nicest of guys. And admittedly, it's easy to understand why people who compare Trudeau to our fatuous oversized orange shit stain find something appealing about a world leader who can, you know, regularly form sentences that are both grammatically correct and free from openly fascist symbolism. But don't get it twisted. Justin Trudeau is no angel. In fact, he's the darling of the Canadian fossil fuel industry. You know, the people responsible for the Keystone XL pipeline and its numerous planned sequels. And an enthusiastic supporter of the military industrial complex as well. For making neoliberalism look sexy again, I am declaring Justin Trudeau this week's lowlife scum. You lowlife scum. In the space of just a few months, the idea of seeking asylum in Canada from the U.S. has gone from a joke that liberals make around election time to a sad reality for dozens of refugees who have been arrested while risking their lives crossing the snowy border between nations. Yeah, arrested. A lot of Americans might not realize that that's what's happening when they see these photos. Well, because the Mounties are helping the asylum seekers, right? Rather than pointing fucking guns at them? But just because their immigrant officers aren't ramboed up does not mean that these refugees are any closer to peace or safety. In 2016, Canada accepted 38,000 refugees, placing it 20th per capita on a list of industrialized nations. Meanwhile, it turns out that nearly half of that number were sponsored by private citizens, not the government. Side note, Trudeau was not one of those private citizens, despite what photo ops might suggest. Indeed, as Montreal-based journalist Martin Lukacs wrote earlier this year in a Guardian article, far from being a genuine haven for refugees, Canada under Trudeau has continued policies, dating back to the odious conservative government of Stephen Harper, or well before, that make life for refugees fleeing to this country exceedingly difficult and dangerous. Martin goes on to outline several of these policies, i.e. thousands of people, including children, getting stuffed into indefinite detention for, quote, irregular arrival, an arbitrary stamp that condemns refugees to prison for showing up unannounced. How dare they? Or how about conditions at said detention centers that have garnered the attention and criticism of the UN? or the deportation and ripping apart of families, tallying more than 100,000 people in the last decade. And that's not to mention the U.S.-Canada Safe Third Country Agreement, which states that anyone who first lands in the U.S. cannot move on to Canada because the U.S. is considered to be a safe country. A ludicrous label, even under Obama, now made even more absurd. And while Canadians have called on Trudeau to repeal this agreement, as of now, It still stands. And yet, this is the image that we see of Trudeau. As Martin puts it, these policies are presided over by Trudeau with none of Trump's venom. But the result is still exclusion, suffering, and heartbreak. This is not the violence of overt hate. It is the violence of empty gestures. 
Beware the neoliberal wrapped in a mask of understanding and compassion. And while immigration is just one of the areas where Trudeau was falling short of dreamy do-gooder, it's certainly not the only one. Despite the opposition of water protectors from Canada's First Nations, Trudeau applauded Trump's decision to restart the Keystone XL pipeline. Remember, the southern Obama-approved half is already pumping toxic tar sands through Texas. I've been on the record for many years supporting the Keystone XL because it leads to economic growth and good jobs for Albertans, Trudeau told reporters last month. Now that is decidedly less attractive than Trudeau's trusting face, isn't it? And the Keystone XL pipeline is just one of several pipeline projects Trudeau supports against the objection of indigenous people and other climate activists. Trudeau also approved the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, which would carry 890,000 barrels of tar sands per day across numerous waterways and traditional First Nation lands, from Alberta to a port in British Columbia. Okay, all right. So you might be thinking, maybe, maybe Canada isn't moving fast enough to phase out fossil fuels, but what about, what about social justice or health care? Surely Canada remains a bastion of hope in those areas. Except that, under Trudeau, Canada's celebrated universal health care system is increasingly threatened by dismantling and privatization, with Trudeau once again following in the footsteps of his most conservative predecessor, Stephen Harper. And just like in the States, prison reform activists in Canada are grappling with the overuse of solitary confinement after the death of a prisoner in solitary late last year. And far from resisting the United States' agenda of endless war overseas, Canada's top general last month predicted that, quote, Canada is poised to do great things with its American allies in the era of U.S. President Donald Trump. Great things like uh, lie about and then complete a $12 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia, known for their gross oppression of women and the widespread execution of dissidents, religious minorities, and LGBTQIA people. That's right. Even though Trudeau made headlines for marching in the Toronto Pride Parade, he and Canada's Liberal Party also falsely claimed that there was no way to cancel a massive arms deal with a dictatorial nation that executes queer people just for the crime of existing. If this all stinks of hypocrisy from a country that claims to be a bastion of human rights and civility, you're not wrong. I guess in the end, it's not so different from the U.S., Whenever neoliberals are in power, they'll stand proudly on a flimsy platform of false promises and progressive ideas, and even make the occasional hard-fought concession to justice and human rights at home. But only so long as it doesn't interfere with the bottom line of corporate donors or the endless growth of our warring Western capitalist empire overseas. So, no matter how handsome or smart, When rulers like Justin Trudeau put the war machine and corporate profit over planet and people, they will always remain low-life scum. You low-life scum. Now moving on, let's meet someone from Canada who isn't low-life scum. Climate system scientist Paul Beckwith. A while back, we sat down with Paul to discuss not just climate change, but what we can realistically do about it. With recent developments such as this one, It's just no longer enough to simply recycle and bike to work. We need to get real about what we're up against and what we can do realistically to mitigate the worst of what we have wrought. For more on the rising tides, the melting ice, and the road ahead, Paul Beckwith. Take a look. Most of the change is in the Arctic. Um, The Arctic is a very sensitive area as far as climate change is concerned because there's a lot of sea ice up there covering the Arctic Ocean. There's also a lot of snow cover on both the ice and the land surrounding the Arctic Ocean. And what we're seeing is an exponential drop in the sea ice coverage of the Arctic Ocean and also in the snow cover, mostly in the spring, up in the Arctic region. So what this means is that the whole region is darker than it used to be. So during the Arctic summers, the um, region is darker. So it's absorbing more solar radiation from the sun. So it's heating up faster and faster. So 
the, it's a it's a feedback effect, a reinforcing uh, feedback effect. As we lose ice, as we lose snow, there's more exposed dark areas, either the open ocean or the permafrost underneath, and that absorbs more sunlight, heats up, melts even more ice. So we get into this uh, cycle, and as a result, the Arctic temperatures are much warmer than the rate of warming in the Arctic exceeds that of anywhere else on the planet. In fact, it's the number that you hear a lot is two times, but it's actually a lot worse than that. The high Arctic is more like five to eight times. Uh, the rate of warming is five to eight times faster than the rest of the planet, especially the equator. The equator doesn't change too much because when there's more heat at the equator, you get more evaporation of water, but the actual temperature isn't rising too much. It is rising, but nowhere near as much. So why this is important um, to the planet is because the jet streams, which guide our weather pattern, basically and basically act as a wall between cold, dry air in the Arctic from warm, humid air further south, are divided by the jet stream. And the jet stream be is determined by that temperature difference between the equator and the Arctic. So as the Arctic temperatures are warming by huge amounts, the temperature difference to the equator decreases. The jet streams, therefore, slow down and become wavier. And this is why we're seeing extreme weather events uh, skyrocketing around the planet. Um, there's, they're happening more often, they're more severe, and also they last longer, and they're also occurring in places where we never had them before. So as, the, as we continue to lose sea ice and snow cover and have a greatly warmer Arctic as, that, those, as those things accelerate, the extreme weather events around the planet will accelerate and that affects infrastructure, it affects global food supply, it affects everybody on the planet essentially. So with that, because the majority of, of our planet is water, talk about the acidification of the oceans because that's also something that you deal with. Uh, what's happening and again, what does that mean for us who live on the land? Yes, so the we, we basically are Greenhouse gas emissions from combustion of fossil fuels, also from changing land use, like getting cutting down forests, replacing them with farmland, we're, we, we've, um, we're reducing the sinks on the planet for CO2, and we're increasing the sources. So the net result is the CO2 levels are going much higher in the atmosphere, as well as other greenhouse gases. So we've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere Whenever it rains, some of that CO2 in the atmosphere gets dissolved in the rainwater, forming carbonic acid, which then falls into the oceans. So over the ocean pH, which is a measure of acidity, that um, has, has been pretty constant without much variance over 40 million years. And what we've done is we've dropped it from 8.2 roughly to 8.05 because it's a logarithmic scale that means an increase of about 30% in ocean acidity. And when that number gets down to 7.8, 7.9, then marine creatures will not be able to form calcium carbonate uh, backbones, um, which many of them rely on. So we're, we're basically harming the food chain. We're getting very precariously um, numbers in pH in the oceans. And when we start harming, you know, it's already happening. We're starting to harm the entire marine food chain. And life cannot exist on the land if there's no life in the oceans. The opposite could happen. We could lose all life on land and the oceans would do just fine. But if we lost the majority of life in the oceans, then the, the, we, couldn't, it, we wouldn't have support for life on land either. So um, I'll get to uh, I'll get to the solutions in a second, but um, for right now, is there is there like a pause button or a slowdown button? What are we definitely going to have to face head on, and what might we be able to mitigate or even possibly avoid altogether? Well, the the climate system is a lot more sensitive than pe many people have recognized. Pe the, People tend to think of things changing in a linear fashion, and this is a highly nonlinear uh, system that we're talking about. So things can, in, you know, for example, temperatures can increase slowly and then they spike upwards to another state. 
And this is this seems to be what is happening in the Arctic. We're transitioning from an Arctic that we were used to to an Arctic with no sea ice cover on the ocean, no snow cover on the land. And we're heading there in a very rapid time frame, less than a decade even. And this can lead to abrupt rises in temperature. You know, the Earth is quite capable of increasing average temperatures, say five degrees in, in a decade or two. So in order to, so I think we need to say, recognize the, first of all, the public and every you know, politicians, everybody, decision makers need to recognize that this is an emergency situation with the climate. We're on the cusp of having these huge irreversible changes. Um, we're already transitioning through this abrupt change and we have to treat it as an emergency. And what we would need to do is we need to slash fossil fuel emissions. We need to um, deploy technologies to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So lower CO2 levels, which would lower ocean acidification levels. And we also need to look at ways, deploy things to cool the Arctic. Because if we go from an Arctic snow covered, ice covered Arctic to an Arctic with completely no ice on the ocean year round or snow up on cover year round, then the carbon that is stored in the permafrost, both on land and in the seafloor, will start coming up in large quantities, um, strengthening the warming. Also, we will lose ice very rapidly from Greenland and sea level rise will, will spike upwards as well. And then once they spike upwards from Greenland, then they will, under, they will cause problems to ice caps also on, on Antarctica. So this uh, winter, the ice is not forming properly in the Arctic. It's it's there's actually days where we lose ice. There's always there's lots of export of thick ice out through the Fram Strait between Greenland and Svalbard. Um, as the ice tries to regrow, it pushes out into warmer water and it gets melted off very quickly. Uh, storms in the Arctic create lots of wave action, which mixes up the water at the surface, which is close to freezing to warmer water below and that's impeding the growth of ice this year. So, so we're out of known territory this year with the present freeze of the ice. So what this is, does is precondition the ice to melt that much faster um, in the next melt season um, as we head into summer of 2017. So, so talking about shifting towards these solutions, um, you mentioned just now the, the fossil fuel emissions. Do you think something like a, a carbon tax is too little too late? Uh, and I'm also curious uh, what your thoughts are on the UN report that um, livestock is responsible for 18% of the greenhouse gases that cause global warming more than cars, planes, and all other forms of transport put together. Yes, the a carbon tax is absolutely necessary for all countries of the world. We need to have a price on carbon because that's um, economically, it's the simplest way uh, to put a price on carbon to reduce carbon going up into the atmosphere ocean system. Um, and we can ramp up the price of carbon as quickly as we need to, to cut fossil fuel emissions. And, but there's no, you know, we have enormous subsidies on fossil fuels at the moment, and that's like a negative carbon tax of about, you know, it's almost in some countries, it's about $40 a ton of carbon. So we're giving fossil fuel companies $40, you know, for each ton of carbon that they put up in the atmosphere. So what's the point of putting a carbon tax on when you have that subsidy? We have to kill the subsidy and put the carbon tax on and we can return the money gathered from the carbon tax with the, call, the carbon fee and dividend, which I'm a real um, advocate of. And this is what Citizens Climate Lobby and James Hansen has been pushing for for quite a while. You, you have a dividend going back to the public. So three quarters of the public gets actually extra money. They get more money back than they pay in fossil fuels. It's heavy fossil fuel users that end up paying more. So that's leg one of my so-called three-legged bar stool or three-pronged approach. Um, that's, the, that's necessary to slash fossil fuel emissions. Also, um, the, yes, meat is a very, livestock is a very large producer of, of uh, carbon. Um, so 
one of the um, so you know it's easy rather than get rid of it completely if we price in a proper carbon tax or carbon price fee then livestock then meat prices will go up significantly and people will cut back on their meat consumption the market will determine how quickly that happens so the most important thing that will is 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 a carbon price a carbon fee so one of the other prongs that you that you talk about <clears throat> going back to the solutions uh, is solar radiation management um, and hacking the climate, basically. And uh, Riley Duran, a systems engineer at NASA, said that geoengineering, of which SRM is a part, isn't a cure. At best, it's a band-aid, and at worst, it could be a self-inflicted wound. Talk about that and talk about using solar radiation management as a tool. Yes. Um... It would be ideal if it was sufficient for us to slash fossil fuel emissions and, and address climate change. But we've set into motion um, changes in a system that are going to continue even when we slash fossil fuel emissions. So slashing fossil fuel emissions is necessary, but not sufficient. So the next phase, the next idea I should mention is the carbon dioxide removal, because even the intergovernment Mental panel on climate change, the IPCC, the last report that came out in um, you know a few years ago, um, assumes for the the RCP representative concentration pathway 2.6 scenario, which is the best case scenario, um, it assumes that at some point we remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and they push a technology they call BEX, which is bioenergy carbon capture and storage, but that's only one idea. That's only one way to lower um, to, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So this is a vital part. This is the only thing that will stop the oceans turning more acidic. This is the only thing that will um, start bringing the levels in the atmosphere down so that their heat trapping properties are similar to, a, a, are, are conducive to a stable climate. But this is not sufficient because the Arctic is warming so quickly. If we lose the sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic, then everything we've seen to do with climate change now will be quickly forgotten because things will get much, much worse by orders of magnitude in terms of storms and in terms of threat to global food supply, et cetera. We're going to have global food shortages. So what we have to do is try to cool the Arctic to bring it back down, to restore the stability, some stability in the jet streams to buy time. And the only way I can see of doing that is to employ some solar radiation management technologies, um, whether they be the quickest thing would be to have some sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere to cool the planet. I call it the anthropogenic Arctic volcano um, because it's a large volcano, puts lots of sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere, cools the planet. So Pinatuba in 91, um, when it went off, it caused the globe, the planet, the global average temperatures to drop out of 0.5 to 0.7 degrees Celsius for three years. And it was because of all the sulfur dioxide that was injected from the volcano into the stratosphere. And once it's in the stratosphere, it's above weather, so it's not rained out. Gravity pulls it down. It takes two or three years. Um, so we could, um, the, the cheapest, quickest, most um, inexpensive way that will be fast acting to cool the Arctic would be to use, you know, sulfur dioxide is only one possible material. There's lots of other ideas using say calcium carbonate and other things. Um, but we're talking about concentrations for sulfur dioxide even that are much lower than what we're putting into the lower atmosphere by coal burning power plants. And that method wouldn't be dangerous or even accessible to, to, for example, humans or plants or animals or anything like that? Well, see, the thing is, is in order to answer that question, we need to compare the risk to society of doing nothing to the risk to society of doing this. What I'm saying is the risk to society of doing nothing is enormous. You know, we're going to lose the ability to feed the world, the people around the world. We're going to get temperatures rising in some farmland areas, so crops fail. We're going to get floods in other farmland areas, so crops fail. We're going to have a suddenly a massive food shortage. Um, this, is this is almost guaranteed if we continue to let climate change accelerate. 
So this is an enormous risk to humanity. So the risk of uh, creating an artificial volcano is, is well known. I mean, we have these things going off naturally. I would say that the risks of, you, we could always stop deploying the technology, right? If it doesn't work, we just stop doing it and it would affect the climate for a couple of years and then that's it, it would go away because that's what happens when there's a large volcano. So we can start off small and start doing it small and ramping it up depending on how, how things work. Um, and we know how it will work because whenever a large volcano goes off, we see these effects all of the time. Our path forward is absolutely necessary. We're in a climate change emergency. This is what we need to do to, um, to ensure that, um, to, to stabilize the climate system. And also what, what we're seeing in the public is we're seeing people go from, you know, climate change isn't a problem, don't worry about it, to we're completely screwed, we can't do anything, right? We're finished, right? Just enjoy life and, you know, we're all gonna die in 10 years or 20 years or pick your number, right? I don't buy either of those, um, either of those proposals or they're extreme views, black and white thinking, either we're all completely fine or we're all going to die. Humans are going to go extinct. I mean, that, that's just ludicrous, ridiculous, polarized, you know, black and white thinking to me. To learn more about Paul's work and to see his own videos about a variety of climate science issues, visit paulbeckwith.net. And speaking of climate, you may have heard about the upcoming climate march here in D.C. on April 29th. Now, as much as I'm a fan of people showing up in D.C. to march and party, I urge you to stay in your own community and work on your local climate issues. Use this National Day of Action on the 29th to sow seeds of both resistance and, more importantly, alternatives. Building in our own towns, in our streets, that is what will make a difference. Find a local pipeline fight, a, a dirty energy project that's just waiting for the people to shut it down. Look in your own backyards. And with that, we'll wrap up this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. For more frequent activist news updates, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com donate. If you'd like to donate directly to ACT OUT, visit patreon.com slash ACT OUT.